How are y'all doing? Doing good. That's, that's great. Glad you're here. Going to do a little dance to that music. <laughs> this morning is our third Sunday in the season of Lent. It is a time of preparation uh, for Holy Week, as we will then tell the story of the last week of Jesus' life in preparation for our Easter Sunday celebration of his resurrection from the dead. Uh, we have been uh, marching along in our sermon series called Seeing Rightly to see ourselves as God sees us, and sometimes I believe that's hard to do. We know that God sees everything about us. He knows our faults, our struggles. He understands our temptations and even our sin. And yet God is also the one that gives us the possibility of redemption, of being integrated back into a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And all of this is really a journey. And like most journeys, it takes time to get there. But the first thing that we have to do is to get real about our own lives to see where we have failed to follow God and to love our neighbor. And until we are honest about that, salvation is really impossible. Salvation is about living our lives in Christ the way that God wants us to live. What seems impossible for us is not impossible for God. Would you bow your heads as we pray for illumination? Oh God, we come before you seeking your word in our lives, a word of both truth and forgiveness. We pray that you would grant us the fullness of your Holy Spirit, that these words of scripture may become the very living word of God that we have known in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our scripture lesson comes from Luke's Gospel, the 13th chapter, beginning at verse 1. Some who were present on that occasion told Jesus about the Galileans whom Pilate had killed while they were offering sacrifices in the temple. He replied, do you think the suffering of these Galileans proves that they were more sinful than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. What about those 12 people who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think that they were more guilty of wrongdoing than everyone else who lives in Jerusalem? No. I tell you, but unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. Then Jesus told this parable. A man owned a fig tree. He planted it in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it and found none. He said to his gardener, look, I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree for the past three years, and I've never found any. Cut it down. Why should it continue depleting the soil's nutrients? The gardener responded, Lord, give me one more year, and I will dig around it and give it fertilizer. Maybe it will produce fruit next year. If not then you can cut it down. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. It only took two hours for a six-man and six-woman jury to convict Bart Whitaker of murder. The mountain of evidence against him was overwhelming. In a murder-for-hire plot, he arranged to have his entire family killed in an apparent home invasion 
in order that he could collect a $1 million insurance policy. The evidence against him was conclusive. The police immediately turned their attention towards Bart. Eventually, he was arrested. He was indicted and put on trial and found guilty of murder. And now the jury of his peers had to decide what his punishment would be, either life imprisonment or death by lethal injection. Bart's father and uncle pleaded before the guilty for mercy. They asked the jury to spare his life even though he had committed this heinous crime. His father said, I've already suffered the loss of so much, I cannot bear to suffer the loss of my only son. And though Bart had shown no remorse during the time of his trial or even at his sentencing, it took the jury two days to come to a conclusion and finally, they, divert, they delivered their verdict that he should die by lethal injection. Ben, I'm sorry, Bart Whitaker was to pay for his crimes with his own life. Now, I have an interest in this story because Bart Whitaker's uncle is a close friend of mine. He is a fellow United Methodist pastor. I went to seminary with Keith, and when I heard about the murder of his sister-in-law and his nephew and the attempted murder of his brother, I called him up and I prayed with him over the phone. And I followed with interest the trial praying for the family all along. And even when he was found guilty, I knew that he would also probably have his life taken from him because the crime was simply too great. Eventually, he was placed on death row, and there he would await his time to be put to death. Now the sentence came no surprise to me because after all, Texas is a law and order kind of state. In fact, we execute more people than any other state in the United States. Uh, and there was one Texas uh, com comedian who even stated uh, that we believe in the death penalty so much that we put in an express lane to get it accomplished. But what's behind that statement is this, that we believe that criminals should be held accountable for their actions, and I think that's true. We should hold those who are convicted for what they have done. But what about when it's you who are the guilty ones? What about when it's you that you've broken the law, whatever it might be, and you're standing before a judge uh, to be tried? Don't we want leniency or mercy instead of justice? Don't we want the scales of justice to weigh towards mercy instead of pain for our crime. You know, I have experience getting a traffic ticket. I know you have too. Well, maybe not all of you. And I've heard of some women who will cry and the police officer will let them off. And in some occasions, maybe they're just feeling good or whatever, uh, and we say, you know, if, if you'll just simply let me off with a warning, I promise you I won't ever do this again. Right. We want 
mercy instead of justice. And when it comes to God as being the great judge of our lives, who knows all about our sin, he, he knows of our guilt, we want the scales of justice to weigh in our favor with grace. The Gospel of Luke tells the story that Jesus, his popularity has grown. Hundreds of people are following him on his journey to Jerusalem. He knows that there is a cross in his future, but no one else does. They simply think that he's riding this tidal wave of popularity that God is about to initiate uh, his kingdom on earth, the liberation of Israel from its Roman captors. And the people followed him because they believed that he was the one who taught with authority, unlike the scribes and the Pharisees in the temple. The people could sense the growing conflict between Jesus and those religious teachers. But no one could even imagine that in just a couple of weeks, he would be betrayed, arrested, tried, and found guilty and sentenced to death. You see, in Jesus' day, there was the popular belief, though it is unfounded, that bad things happen to bad people and good things happen to good people. And if you suffered in some way, either in poverty or in your health, it was because you must have done something wrong to deserve this punishment. Conversely, if you had done that which is right <clears throat> and pleasing to God, then you would receive wealth and health. And yet we know that that's not true. Bad things do happen to good people, and good things do happen to bad people. But in order to try to justify it, we begin to come up with these systems of theology, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But when it comes to us, we want something else. His disciples came to Jesus and they told him the story about those 18 Galileans who were slaughtered in the temple while they were offering sacrifices. And what they were thinking was, what had these Galileans done wrong to deserve that fate? And Jesus replies to them and says, don't think that you are any better than these Galileans, for you too will suffer the same fate as they did. Or have you heard about those uh, Twelve in uh, Jerusalem, when the Tower of Siloam fell and they were killed, do you think that they are any worse sinners than all of you? No, I tell you, you too will die as they did. And then, like a good preacher, he begins to illustrate uh, his uh, sermon with the story. A man uh, who owns a vineyard plants a fig tree. And there is a good reason for that. You've got this land that's uh, not available to be planted with vines. And so you plant other things there. And he plants this fig tree. And for three years, he comes to the fig tree and he finds no figs. Thank you. Just want to make sure you're still listening. He finds no figs, and 
uh, in uh, kind of a fit of anger, he tells this gardener, cut it down, it's worthless. I've come three years and found no figs. But the gardener appeals to the owner and he says to him, just let me give it a little attention. Let me cultivate the soil and work in the manure that would be the fertilizer that would help the tree to produce fruit. And he said, when you come back next year, if there's no fruit, then you can cut it down. You see, from a businessman's point of view, a fruitless tree was worthless. But given the opportunity to produce fruit, if it did not do so, then it should be cut down. And when I hear these words, I remember the words of John the Baptist, who came telling the people to repent, for there is one who is coming, whose axe is already at the root of the trees, and whose fire will be all-consuming. Of course, he was talking about Jesus. But the good news that I think we should focus on today in this gospel is that God is a God of second chances. He is always willing to give us another opportunity to return back to him. We see it when Peter goes to Jesus and he asks him, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins, sins against me? The law said three times, but Peter, wanting to be generous, says seven times? And Jesus says to Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven. In other words, an unlimited amount of times you should forgive the offender. But God's sovereignty and justice demands that we convict the guilty. But God's love and mercy always tips in our favor. You see, the Apostle Paul was right when he said, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all deserving of death. And yet God sent his only son into the world to save the world. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but rather to give us eternal life. When it comes to to either God's justice or God's mercy, God will err on the side of mercy every time. And sometimes that's hard for us to take, especially when we are the one who has been hurt or offended. How can we forgive the offender? And it is equally true if we extend mercy to them, how would they ever be able to understand? Mercy is not just to get us off the hook, but rather mercy is granted toward us to begin to woo us in the direction of repentance. In other words, to change our own hearts and our own lives and bear the fruits of that repentance, to live a life that is changed to be lived for God. And instead of getting what we deserve, God gave us a son. I want to share with you this happy encounter that I had in Huntsville one time uh, when I was uh, driving north on 45, and, and you know, there's that exit that you can go towards Trinity. I don't know if any of you have taken that. But it's a rather uh, steep hill, and as you exit, you know, you're going the same speed limit you were on the highway, 75 miles an hour. <laughs> and then you come to this curve, and you know, it's kind of cool, you take that curve, and then there's a police officer, 
actually a sheriff's deputy, parked on the side of the road, and you know right then and there you're busted. As I passed him, he flipped on his lights, and I just pulled over. I knew what was coming. He asked for my driver's lessons and uh, also for my insurance. And he said, sir, do you know how fast you were going? I said, no, not really. I was, wasn't paying attention. He said, well, you were going 75 in a 60 mile an hour zone. And then he asked me, is there some emergency? And I said, no, not really. My friend and I, we are uh, going to a pastor's retreat <laughs> at Lakeview Methodist Assembly in Palestine, Texas. And with that, he took my license and my insurance card, and he went back to his cruiser, and he probably ran some kind of uh, check on my record. And then he came back and he said, I'm just gonna give you a warning this time, but the next time you're driving through Huntsville, I hope that you'll pay better attention to the speed limit. And do you know what happened? Every time I go through Huntsville, I pay close attention <laughs> to the speed limit. I've learned my lesson because grace was extended to me. Mercy was shown, and that caused a change in my behavior. It made me want to follow the law. Even though I didn't intend to break the law, nonetheless, I was guilty. But that officer, like God, gave me a second chance. Mercy when I did not deserve it, causing repentance, a change of heart, and a change of how I live my life. Thanks be to God that God gives us that second chance. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.